Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Thanks, Kirsten. I'm not a physicist, so I don't know what your essay is going to be about. I apologize. Um, as Kirsten said, so I'm a virologist. I trained in the UK uh, for a number of years. I moved to the States about 16 years ago. You can tell it's 16 years because of my really strong South Philly accent that I picked up along the way. Um, so talking about this movie tonight, there's a lot of virology in it, which is pretty cool. There's a lot of time travel, which might help the guys from Westchester. Um, I'm going to focus on the virology. There's a couple of hidden things in there. There's a couple of hidden clues with sort of homage to some major apocalyptic viral events over the course of history. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Philly, just to kick off later on after the movie. Spend the bulk of my talk on the virology, uh, give you some context as to why today the chances of some sort of viral apocalypse happening are almost zero. And I'll talk about that, almost zero. In, in, in emphasis on the zero and the almost, right? Um, and then finally talk a little bit about Mad Brad as well, because I think his performance that was nominated for an Oscar in the movie is fantastic as well. So I'll finish off on a bit of a, a lighter note after some of the heavy science and so on. So hopefully you enjoy the movie. It's a fantastic movie. Um, Terry Gilliam's movies are all good. Uh, to me, this is one of his best, one of my favorites. So hope you enjoy it and uh, look forward to talking to you at the end of the movie. Thank you. Thank you. So while we wait for, um, for the slides to come up, I'll just talk just a little bit about the movie, just a little bit more. Um, so when Kirsten asked me, we were talking about what movie I was going to talk about today. Um, and uh, I'm, she said, well, you know, what is your science background? I said, well, virology and hematology are two things that I've worked in the most. So we talked about some movies, and, and she suggested 12 Monkeys, uh, which was a great choice. It was nice to sort of remember the film and then watch it a couple of times as well. And there's some big, some big things in it for me that stood out, right? There's the first bit around Philly. I know Baltimore's in it as well, but there's a lot of things set in Philly in the film, which I think is really great. There's obviously the, the continual theme through the whole thing around this sort of post-apocalyptic world live, being lived uh, by the humans that are left, which is uh, classic sort of Terry Gilliam, the sort of um, dystopian, dark, uh, world that he portrays in all of his all of his different movies, and then of course you got the performance of uh, of Brad Pitt in addition to uh, Madeline Stowe and Bruce Willis as well. So they are the three things I'm going to talk about today. So when the movie was made in '95, that's what I looked like. <laughs> it's the only surviving photo of me in a lab, right? <laughs> so, so um, I should have grown the sideburns for tonight, shouldn't I? Because but they'd be white. That's the only problem. Um, so this is me, as I mentioned earlier, I used to work in London. So St. Bartholomew's Hospital is one of the oldest hospitals in the world, founded in the 12th century. Um, it's incredibly old. Um, and what I was doing there on this particular day, that's actually at a bench where I was doing same day HIV testing. And we'll talk a little bit about HIV later. And there's, there's some subliminal messages around HIV throughout the movie as well, actually, which I'll come back to. Um, and this is um, one of the reasons why. So I worked in, in virology for seven years. Um, in the lab in the UK, moved to work uh, within the pharmaceutical industry, uh, developing antiviral drugs to, to fight against, and vaccines to fight against uh, viruses. So let's go back to Philly a little bit, right? So um, it's very dark, and I, I sort of did some reading, and it's, it's portrayed as a very dilapidated city in the film, right? Um, it's incredibly run down, deliberately picking scenes, and, and obviously exaggerating some of the scenes as well and some of the venues and locations as well, the, the, the theater uh, that they chose and outside some of the old buildings. Um, but interestingly, as much as we all sort of see Philly and, and Phoenixville indeed, right, and the area has been regenerated, the poverty level in Philly remains actually roughly, I looked it up, it's roughly the same as it was. The murder rate is actually not much different. So Philadelphia in itself, as much as we know the pieces that have improved so much, it's still, uh, in, in terms of all of Terry Gilliam's films, um, as an American who left America deliberately to go to Europe because of his feelings around America and where America was becoming and where it had become. 
he portrays that all the time in his films. And as much as it was exaggerated, even for then, uh, you know, Philly still has that image, image today. Uh, having said that, it's always good to see it in different, uh, always good to see it in different movies. So let's talk about viruses then. Let's get on to the main topic and the, the bit of the science beyond the social science. Let's talk about the clinical science that I know. Um, so science are obligate intracellular parasites. What does that mean, right? Um, they're obliged to be parasitic. They're obliged to live within the cells of other, uh, other organisms, right? They cannot survive. A bacteria can survive on a matrix, on a Petri dish. Uh, fungi, yeasts, other sort of uh, microbes can live independently outside of a cell. Viruses uniquely have to be inside cells all the time, right? There are some, some yeasts, some bacteria that require that, but all viruses require that, right? So well, that's important. So the scene right at the end of the film where he holds up a completely empty vial, never gonna happen, right? Because need, they need to be in something in order that you can see. You know they're microscopic, they need to be in a cell and to have a cluster of cells that could do the damage that's portrayed in the film, you probably need to have them. First, that's the first thing to note. The second thing that's really important, especially in the context of this film, is that viruses evolve with their hosts, right? And they have many different hosts. They infect bacteria, they infect um, mammalian cells, they infect plants, right? There are lots of famous plant viruses that can wipe out whole crops. Um, the reason that's important is a virus is sort of evolutionary um, sort of predisposed to not destroy the host that it's in. Because if it destroys its host, it has nowhere to live, right? So the ideal virus doesn't actually cause a catastrophic event um, in, in its host, right? So that's something to remember. And as I go through some other bit of depth now, I'll keep coming back to that theme as we go through the whole thing. So what are some of the determinant factors that would maybe make a virus be one that we should be you know, particularly concerned about? We're all, all of us sitting here right now have them in our body, right? We, we have them in different stages. How are they transmitted? So the, route, the mode of transmission, the route of transmission is really important for how a virus spreads. How does it spread from host to host, right? Sometimes it's transmitted from animal to animal via a mosquito, for example, or directly from animal to animal in the case of diseases like flu that go from fowl to pigs to humans, right? In the Far East, every year there's an epidemic that comes out of the Far East. That's always how it starts, right? So the route of transmission is really important, right? Some viruses need to be blood to blood, right? Or, or body fluid to body fluid. So you have to have that human, human to human contact or host to host contact for them to spread. Others are able to survive in the environment, not grow in the environment, but survive. And then you get contaminated on your fingers, your hands, touching your mouth. Think of um, no, um, viruses that you see on cruise ships and elsewhere that can cause sort of winter vomiting disease and things like that. Right, think of the cold virus that might be sort of transmitted airborne in an airborne environment, right? So transmission is obviously an important piece. The infectivity piece is important too. So certain different viruses need a different amount of virus to be infectious to a host. So for some of them, they can be incredibly small numbers, right? Very, very low dose. Some of them need a relatively high dose, right? So that can be an important factor as well, right? It starts to make sense in terms of different viruses. Um, in terms of virulence, what's their sort of propensity to cause disease? Some viruses don't cause disease. Sometimes the same virus in two different hosts, two different animals, two different humans might have a different response, right? But generally there's sort of a scale of virulence and a, and a virus's ability to, to cause a catastrophic, catastrophic disease if there is a large enough um, infectious dose and it's able to grow in the cells. You can get to think of things like rabies, that can cause catastrophic diseases if they actually take hold within a host, right? You have to catch something like rabies before it actually takes hold. Otherwise, um, it's, it's pretty much 100% um, fatal, right? Something like rabies. Think of something uh, that might be acute or chronic. I mentioned sort of norovirus and, and winter vomiting disease and things like that that are spread easily. Um, they're very acute. They last a few days. Horrible weather if you've ever had one of those conditions, but they're gone within a few, in a few days, right? Whereas something that can be really chronic, like a hepatitis B or hepatitis C infection, sometimes they call them insidious, where you don't even know that you have them. They're sort of hiding away inside and sort of ticking over, sometimes for decades before they manifest themselves in an illness. And sometimes they can even go latent. So the virus has, worked, has evolved with us to work out a way 
to hide itself within your cells, and then it comes out maybe in the future when you're in times of stress. Think of chicken pox, and down the road you get zoster, right? Think of um, uh, herpes inf other herpes infections, herpes simplex. You might get a flare up from ultraviolet. You're not getting reinfected, that's the same infection coming out at the same point on your body every time, right? So viruses have come up with all these different strategies as they've evolved with us to survive. So something like a herpes virus, I worked in a lab where there was a lot of herpes research going on and, and everybody has a favorite virus. It kind of sounds kind of creepy, I know. Um, we, we had a guy there that, that used to, you pack, and he, they, they're almost the perfect virus because they cause just the right amount of disease and just to cause a lesion, right, on a membrane, like a, a lip or a genital lesion to allow for spread, and then it goes away, becomes asymptomatic. Sometimes those hosts shed, and then you can get you get person-to-person -person transmission on the road. But generally, that per they're generally not fatal unless somebody has a immune system that's really suppressed. It's generally not not a, a fatal infection, right? And then the host response is important as well. So I just mentioned people becoming run down, becoming stressed, and then having an event where they get in zoster. Uh, that's that's a common common occurrence, and often some of, the, some of the diseases, some of the symptoms are actually caused by the host response. So that's influenza virus on the right-hand side, um, and most of the symptoms of flu are actually your body's, they call it a cytokine storm, right? Your body reacts to the flu infection to try and beat it, hence the fever, et cetera, to try and stop it growing in the cells, um, and you get that cytokine storm. So the symptom isn't actually directly the virus, it's actually your body's response to that virus. So the movie was about plagues, right? It was about, it was about one particular sort of apocalyptic event of a, of a virus that was deliberately spread. So interestingly, there were some cities, so I, I, it took me the recent, I watched it a couple of times recently and I watched it. So the cities he goes to are actually significant, not all of them, but some of them are really significant. So two years before the movie was made, there was a flu pandemic that started in Peking. He went to Peking, right? HIV is famous in the US for having been identified on the West Coast. It was actually LA before San Francisco, but there were some historical samples from the gay community in San Francisco where, where HIV was first detected. He went to San Francisco. And Kinshasa in um, Central Africa was also mentioned. And that's where in 1959, the first um, recorded or historical case of, of HIV was detected, right? So it's actually interesting how they sort of thread that, thread that into the movie. So there have been some major historic plagues. Um, smallpox was mentioned in the speech that she made, right, when she was at the, at the museum in the movie. Um, smallpox is something I almost worked backwards just to reassure everybody was, was eradicated. 1979, there are only a handful of samples now left in, in a small number of category four, the highest level four, labs around the world so that in case anything happens in the future, they're able to remake the vaccine. It was eliminated through vaccination, as everybody knows. Um, first recorded plague of that, and I'll see if people can work out what the, so that was in Roman times, it was the plague of Galen, right? There was, most people think of smallpox, some people it might have been measles. Um, and then in 1520, there was um, a European traveler that moved from Cuba to the, the American mainland to, to the, the continental Americas, brought smallpox. And then in, in 1780 was when there was a, a smallpox out, um, epidemic that broke out and spread and, and killed out a lot of Native Americans in the, in the plains and to the west, west of the plains, right? So these are really significant. And if you think about the fact that their populations, right? Think of, think of the Romans, think, which is Terry Gilliam thing. Think of the Romans, right? But um, <laughs> the young people are going, what's he talking about? Um, watch Life of Brian, you'll get it. Um, the, 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 these are civilizations, these are big cities that form, right? You get, you get people crowded together for the first time in history. You get enough of them, you get an infection, it spreads, you get a plague, right? Uh, interestingly as well with smallpox, you had this continent of people that hadn't been in, exposed to these infections before. They lived a completely agrarian existence, right? Maybe a few small villages or a couple of cities, but generally dispersed out across the whole of two enormous continental masses in North and South America. As soon as the Europeans came and brought diseases, then there were plagues right across, right across the US in effect. Um, World War I also featured in the film. I don't know whether this was deliberate or not, but there were more, I mean, World War I is the most deadly um, battle, you know, ever on earth in terms of, in terms of loss of life. Um, 
in Europe, the uh, 1918, f immediately following the First World War, was the outbreak of what was called the Spanish flu, H1N1 uh, influenza virus that wiped out, depending on different literature that you read, 30 to 100 million people around the world, right? Massive, massive flu. Any Downton Abbey fans in here would have seen the whole piece in that as well, right? And I mentioned, I mentioned the, the, the cases around HIV and AIDS. And then bubonic plague, which is the one that people call the plague, right? Black Death was actually not a virus, hence my, my parentheses on it, my brackets. It was actually caused by a, a bacteria that infected the fleas. So you had, you had rats to fleas to humans, right? So that's another pattern too. If you cross species, you tend to get that higher virulence, right? The virus hasn't evolved with you as the host, as the new animal, therefore the disease can be more severe, right? Bringing it back to that host effect that I mentioned earlier. So in terms of other categories, so they are plagues. That's right at the top end of sort of historically defining, literally changing the population. Think of, think of HIV right now. There are still almost 40 million people in the world infected with HIV. Uh, in the US alone, it's still more, I think it's 1.2 million last year in the US, right? Infections, I think, run at about 70,000 a year in terms of incidence in the US. So it's still, still incredibly common and important disease globally, and indeed where we are in the United States. Um, but you also get these sort of terms out there, pandemic, epidemic, et cetera, et cetera, outbreaks. Outbreaks are usually contained, really small, I gave that example, you might get a school that would have an outbreak to close the school down for a few days while they sort of disinfect it or, or stop the kids coming in to spread it if they see, you know, particularly um, virulent cold sort of spreading through a school it's by uh, RSV or one of those viruses. Um, SARS was one that was famous in the, in the Far East about 10 years or so ago, right? Severe acute respiratory syndrome where there were coronaviruses that were, that were spreading um, and caused about, I think about eight or 9,000 deaths uh, in, the, in the Far East at that time, and the odd sporadic case made it to other continents because of, because of travel and so on. You had the sort of epidemics that would then spread beyond very localized into different countries. Uh, locally, you saw the Ebola outbreak just a couple of years ago in West Africa, right? And you get a few single cases coming back to the West of healthcare workers. Ebola does have a high, is, is, is um, virulent, does have a high um, fatality rate, but as soon as it's understood and, 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 a, and you can put in place some containment, which I'll talk about in a moment, that, that can be pretty well contained within a few sort of cycles and, and, uh, of infection. And it tends to pop up in places where there isn't much healthcare infrastructure as well. So the chances of that happening somewhere like here is, uh, is obviously minimized. Zika is one that obviously made, made a lot of news last year um, as it spread up through South America into some of the southern states of the US. And this is a case where you had that, that, that uh, vector, you had, a, you had a, a Aedes aegypti mosquito was the, the transmission vector moving from human to human, um, transmitting that, and it's also sexually transmitted as well, uh, sort of like a, a double threat there. Um, and as it turned out, absolutely, um, you get birth defects in children born to mothers that are infected and, um, or fathers that actually pass it on as well. But interestingly, the, uh, the amount of disease caused by it in those, in those children actually wasn't as high as they thought it was going to be. Once they started to understand the epidemiology, they saw the primary cases of these children's being bo children being born. Once they started to do research back and understand, well, how many people are actually infected, it was a very small population, a uh, much smaller number than they thought. I don't actually know the numbers of that, but it was much less of a threat. But those of us that sort of grew up in the in the 60s and 70s, remember rubella. Rubella was a similar sort of thing where, where mothers, and my mom actually lost a, lost a child to rubella uh, before I was born, so or after I was born. Um, so yeah, rubella was a similar sort of thing where the, the parents would have a mild, mild infection, but the children were, were getting birth defects. And you had the flu pandemic just a few years ago, uh, at the back end of the last decade, uh, it was massively important. You had huge, huge infections, and very serious infections of, of flu. Um, moving across, moving across the globe, and, and World Health sort of mobilised to uh, to combat that, and then endemic, where it's something that's in the population. It's always going to be there. You're not going to get rid of it, right? At the moment, be with modern technology, or or the virus has evolved so much with us, it's really difficult for us to eradicate it. Herpes is a classic classic example of that, and yellow fever. If you look at a map of yellow fever across South America and Africa around the tropics, uh, around the equatorial uh, part of those countries. If you ever go to those places, you always need a vaccine 
to go because it's endemic. It's just right. It's infe it's it's a constant infection that's in that community, um, uh, and and always dangerous for us going there without any immunity. Very dangerous for us to to arrive in. So what what are, what things are in place to sort of combat this globally? Some of these will be familiar to you all. So the surveillance, the whole idea of you know the CDC down in Atlanta, as an example. I used to work at the the, the UK equivalent of that. Uh, which is a much smaller lab because America's everything's bigger, right? Uh, at Central Public Health Labs uh, in Collindale in North London. So surveillance is huge. And the reason I had the Google symbol up there, so during the pandemic a few years ago, uh, you may know this, so the WHO was tracking the pandemic as it moved across the globe, right? Looking at the cases that were appearing in the medical systems as they were moving across. And people look back at Google and Google was always two days ahead, right? In other words, people were searching for remedies for the symptoms they had two days before they would end up being sick and then going in the hospital and being treated for it. So the hospital stuff that the WHO was tracking was always two days behind, right? Um, and there are some, some um, tools now that are out there that even try to detect it even earlier than that uh, as well. Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. So in terms of uh, prevention, think of the publicity campaigns around HIV and AIDS, uh, back in, particularly back in the 80s. A lot of us remember, and if you go to any college campus now, you see, you see a lot of, lot of advertisements around, around prevention. Um, vaccination, obviously massive. You think about polio being an uncommon disease in most parts, almost eradicated, not quite there, almost eradicated, very close. Uh, smallpox already eradicated, and certain diseases that used to be ones that, that caused um, massive illness and a lot of death, like measles and so on, are now very much controlled, right? Um, in terms of containment, think of, um, think of Ebola, right, at, at that scale, where you had that sort of global um, containment on a, on, a, on a sort of world scale with, with Western medicine moving into West Africa to try and contain it locally. Uh, but then also think, as I said, mentioned earlier, around the containment piece around schools, cruise ships, confined spaces where you've got lots of people where the spread, the spread is really easy. And, in, and you know, what are, the, what are the, the treatments for patients? Depending on the disease, sometimes supportive care, sometimes specific medicines to treat are not available. Sometimes there is an antiviral medicine that can be used. Uh, often there isn't. So again, some of these severe infections, then all, all it can be offered is something that would help dampen down the host response um, in order that the patient can recover uh, and, and the virus would just naturally uh, wane away. Um, and then you've got specific antivirals, of which there are many for many, many different diseases now. And, and a lot of them are even advertised on TV nowadays, but you're seeing them more and more, um, hepatitis, HIV, herpes, etc. lots of different antivirals that have been developed over the years um, in order to help curb. And, and indeed, HIV, as we know, um, has been turned to some extent into a chronic disease now because of, because of these medicines that have been developed. So that was the science bit around uh, the virology that was sort of in the movie and trying to sort of relate that back to some of the, the basic fundamentals. But for me, the, the Brad Pitt, I have a huge man crush. My wife is just, she doesn't mind me saying it. I have a huge man crush on Brad Pitt. I think he's great. I, I enjoy his movies. I enjoy all of them. And this is one of his best, I think. Um, it's almost like this. I think he must have done Fight Club after this. I can't remember the, the chronology of the two. But if so you see the sort of Tyler Durden piece, the sort of this light wackiness. This is like on a scale above that. Which, which I think is great, and Inglorious Bastards is another one that I love as well. I, I think that movie's great. Where he has a real edge to him, and he's, he's kind of vicious, is great. But at the same time, I like all of his cuteness as Rusty in Ocean's Eleven, right? With a, and I, I tease people at work. There's a couple of people I work with who are convinced every time they meet with me, I'm eating something. And I say to them, well, like Rusty in Ocean's Eleven, right? Where he's always eating. So that's, that's the Brad Pitt I, I think of. But I think in this movie, he's fantastic. I was listening to the audience deliberately tonight when I saw the different pieces, I knew it was funny. And, and sort of university, pe universally, people laughed at the bits that I found funny. I thought he's fantastic. And there's a great story about Terry Gilliam. Couldn't get him to be crazy enough in the early screenings on the movie when they went to the Eastern State Penitentiary downtown, right, to, to film a lot of the scenes in the hospital. And Terry Gilliam took his cigarettes off him and delayed filming for a couple of then started filming again, the idea being, and he was, and he got all wired after he stopped smoking his cigarettes and was all, uh, all tanked up. So that was about, I thought I'd end on something a little bit light other than all the stuff around apocalyptic plagues, uh, just, just in terms of Brad Pitt, obviously got nominated for a, I think he won the Golden Globe for it too, right? I think, yeah, exactly. So thank you everybody for, uh, for listening and staying. Maybe we'll have a little Q&A 
at the end here. Uh, thanks for your attention and I uh, hope you enjoyed the movie and hope you enjoyed the discussion and come down the front and in engage in a Q&A. Thank you. Go. Um, can you explain again the difference between an, uh, an, pandemic, an epidemic and a pandemic? Scale. So, um, endemic means that it's, it's, in, a, it's in a population um, and it's established itself with that, with that population. Mm -hmm. um, it probably isn't causing severe disease all the time, or if it is, then that population isn't able to sort of control it by either natural method, methods or medical, or medical intervention. So what I mean by that is um, papillomavirus, herpes virus, other, other viruses are just, they're with us, right? We all, anybody that's ever had a cold, so anybody that's ever had chicken pox still has that virus right. inside them, right? So that's what I mean by endemic. That's endemic. Yep, so that's, that's in that population, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of fixed there. Epidemic is when you then get something, an outbreak is a small, small, um, literally that, an outbreak, mm -hmm. right? Maybe if, if somebody here started coughing and, and spluttering and somebody could be got infected, that would be an outbreak. It would only turn into an epidemic if um, it then spread to higher scales. So if that scale was wider, slightly wider geographical area, wider numbers, and then pandemic by definition is global. When it then goes global, you, and it's usually you, um, the, the only, well, the main two diseases that it's associated with are HIV because of the global, the global threat that it presented and still presents, um, and then flu. When flu um, spreads globally um, on, a, on a, actually on an annual basis it spreads globally. So I actually think the terms there get a little mixed up because it, it, by definition it's almost always a pandemic because it spreads out of Asia and goes global every year. But then they use it as to, to define scale. So on a year where it's at a normal level, they'll call it an epidemic. When it's at a much higher level, they start referring to it as a pandemic. And usually with a pandemic, when the virulence is higher, people get sicker, the death rate is higher, the fatality rate is higher. The flu, flu is a major, is, you know, it's, as a major mortality association, if it's a particularly virulent strain that's associated with a lot of human disease. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Oh, if you want, uh, actually, I want to ask you two questions. Yeah. So I can't, this light's bright. Most people get... You can come down. I come down, come down yeah. Come down in front and see a little easier to see. Yeah. yeah. Most people get chickenpox once, most people. Yeah. One of my kids had chickenpox three times. Wow. Um, why would that happen to certain people and not for, you know, hardly, hardly anybody? Was it always a sort of all body yeah. infection? Yeah. Yeah. That's unusual, it's very unusual. I mean, full on chickenpox three times. Yeah. Unusual, don't know. I mean, different strains of virus or something in the, the immune system that, that didn't pick it up the second time. Usually it gets suppressed by the body's immune system naturally, right? And, and goes latent in the, in the nervous system, actually. And it would only flare up. Um, but it sounds like it was primary infection every time. Yeah. Unless it never, what was the, the time difference between them? Uh, I don't know, it was, all, it was all before he was 10 years old. But it was within just a few years? Yeah, well maybe it was the same one coming, maybe it never, never went away, right? It was the same, could have been the same infection. And something else just occurred to me listening to you talk there about, you know, when you said about, you know, the virus wants to keep the host body alive, obviously. So, it, like, is there any research into, would a virus go in and kill another virus in order to, well, they infect, they infect bacteria, which is interesting. So, so even bacteria have viruses that go bacteriophages that, that, there's a, that, that can actually eat. So they'll infect other microbes, but not, because a virus isn't a cell. It's non-cellular, and it needs another cell, so and by technically they cannot infect another virus. So you could never virus. use a virus as like a, a weapon to fight other viruses? Unless you wanted to prime, so the way it could be used, so you can use... So a lot of, some vaccinations work by attenuation. So what they do is you take a, a live virus um, and you modify it, you, you, you shock it in some way that makes it no longer fully infectious or fully effective. You then give that to people. Their hum immune system recognizes that as the actual parent virus, if you like. They build an immune response and then they don't get infected the second time. So indirectly you can do it, but not directly. Does that make sense?
talks about how the movie got it wrong. Um, but is there, I think we know there's a possibility. What are your, what's your perspective on the possibility of a, like a big huge move on and trade or something like that happening in this day and time? This, this day now, no, right? I think, so think of, there was, a, there was an interesting uh, monologue in the scene where the, the, the guy that spread the virus, when he, he leans over and talks to her at the book signing, he says, he talks about climate change, he talks about population expansion, did it, right? So if the temperature of the earth continues to rise, if um, vectors become uncontrollable, um, and if the population of the earth itself in terms of humans on earth continues to grow at the rate that it has in the last 50 years, then, then you're gonna start to get some of the scenarios that might start to make something like this possible. But right now, no, but it, it's, it's decades and centuries away, right? But, but the, the good thing is we sort of know what things, I'm saying that's good, we know what things um, might happen and what, what can take us towards catastrophe. And then it's about whether we have the will to stop those things occurring, right? Which is a very, we'd end up in a political science conversation then, right? <laughs> I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to go there, but you get, you get what I mean, right? But at the moment, no, I don't think it's there. The only other way is if somebody, I mean, biological weapons, right, have, have existed um, for, for, for a long time, actually, and, and even back many years ago, people used to, used to use it before they actually knew what they were doing, that they actually had germs in them. They sort of, you know, tried to infect cities with, they would fl fling dead bodies and dead animals into, into siege cities, right? In medieval times, you hear stories about things like that. Um, so that's what, that's weaponized. So if you weaponized stuff, then maybe you could have that. But, um, but yeah, you'd, you'd, need, you'd need a whole series of catastrophic events, I think, before you'd ever get to that point. That's what I mean by, at the moment, no, right? Because I think we have good enough there's enough um, uh, common sense and enough infrastructure and enough technology to start to, and, and presumably as we go forward, we'll build new technologies to detect this stuff earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, yeah, I, I, I did some research at the, the, the place that he used to work, actually, um, at the same, at, at the same, I never met him at the same time. Um, yeah, he was immediately, I mean, he's, he's no longer in the UK, he's completely ostracized because of what he did, because there was no scientific validity. Sorry, so Andrew Wakefield is the, is the infamous physician that... Um, basically tried to give the, the anti-vaccine movement some scientific credibility. And he did a study, um, which was flawed in many, many different ways, where he tried to make an association between autism, gastrointestinal effects, and vaccination, right? Um, and the experimental design was flawed, the consent of the patients was flawed, the pathology, it was many, many things. It's actually, people teach that paper in scientific theory to sort of show, well, this is how you, you don't do it, right? And I, yeah, so and I, there's stuff I could say with you that, to, about that as well that I won't go into now, but, but, but technically though, there, there's been some, um, there were a lot of research put out almost immediately after things that were published and there were epidemiology studies um, at a scale, and he did his study, if I remember, it was only in dozens of patients, a very, very small sub, yeah, seven. seven, there you go, right? So a tiny, tiny, tiny study. Some of these epidemiology studies are in the thousands, and there was a Scandinavian study that I remember that came out probably about only a year, two years after it, that almost completely debunked it, where the they looked at the, the things that were claimed in the paper on a much, much larger scale with statistical power and were able to, able to, to debunk the theory. And since then, there's been, a, there's been a lot of data. But, you know, smallpox overall over history was about 30% fatal, right? That's incredible to think about a disease. That was, that, was, that was relatively common globally, right, at the time, is now completely eradicated. Polio, which, which many of us um, would have had friends and relatives that would have been you know, crippled by that disease where the virus infects the, the, nervous, the nervous system, central nervous system, people had difficulty breathing, difficulty moving, et cetera. You don't, you don't see those people anymore, right, because, because of the vaccines 
I think of uh, my, you know, my story with, with, with rubella and my family and so on and so forth. So lots of, are there vaccines for every disease? No. Um, is every vaccine equally effective um, in every person, every time? No, right? But that's the nature of biology. Biology is, is not, a, it's not, it's not physics, right? It's not engineering. It's a, it's a different kind of science. So that would be my, that would be my story. It's show, show the evidence. Actually, with students, for me, it's, it's use it as a way to describe science because it's a great description of science because one of the definitions is, as you know, right, as a scientist is, you have to be able, the whole idea of, of publishing peer-reviewed data is you allow somebody else to replicate your work. If they cannot replicate your work, that first paper, no matter how groundbreaking it was, is never really established, right? And, and that, that was never done with that, with that poorly designed study. So I, that's, the way I would, that's the way I would discuss it. Anyway. Sorry? Who published it? Yeah, they did. They did. I mean, there's a lot of yes. I mean, there's a lot of um, medicine is political, right? Science is like anything else is political as well. Um, I, I, I don't know why it was published, right? I mean, um, I, I don't know whether there was a retraction. I can't recall. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So it's a really interesting one. So it's, it's, it's called a retrovirus. Uh, it's very complex. So um, it's able to actually incorporate itself into the, the DNA of the host and use the host's um, own cells as the sort of engine to produce more, more viruses to affect other cells. Uh, in humans, it infects white cells um, in, in the body, which is how it's transmitted via blood. Um, and once it's sort of inserted itself into the into the into the, the DNA, it's then it's then stuck there, right? So um, you can treat people down to very low levels of virus, right? But completely eradicating it has not been has not been completely achieved. There are some you know you might get some case studies where people claim to have to have gone to to, to zero levels and then withdrawn it, and then you don't get them. But but generally. The, the current theory is that they go down to a, to a low level and you have to maintain that with, with antivirals long term in order to suppress it. But um, it's related to a lot of to viruses that it was first actually characterized as a, a, a virus that might cause um, leukemia. So there are some viruses that are associated with leukemias uh, that again incorporate themselves into the cells of the host and then stay there and then turn the, you know, and then um, the disease in those patients was leukemia and the HIV. They get the suppression of the immune system. And then once they get the suppression of the immune system, other infections, and, and the way it was first spotted was that there were pneumonias that were usually really rare. There were skin lesions that were usually really rare. And then ocular and, and um, pulmonary lung symptoms that were really rare that started to appear in, in patients, in populations that we now consider to be, to be high risk, like. Um, sex workers and, and uh, homosexual men. So um, that's how it was found, because the immune systems are suppressed because the virus has knocked out the immune system, which then leads to other viruses and infections taking hold um, and, uh, and causing the disease. In, in the US or? In the world. Um, you don't want to get rabies. <laughs> no, it's, there's, only a, there's only a couple of, couple of cases, one or two cases a year um, in the US in humans. Um, it's, and it's another one of those interesting ones, right, where you've got host to host, right? You get, you get different mammals that can, that can be infected, um, and then it causes behaviors in those hosts that actually allow them to transmit, right? If you think about it, but they, you don't have, they don't have much time to do it. Um, so if you're if you're bitten by a rabid animal, the, the protocol is to be given um, globulins, rabies gamma globulins. So these are immune products that they isolate from blood at a huge scale, uh, enriched with the antibodies to the rabies virus, and then they give you rabies vaccine, right? Before you become symptomatic, 
and that, that's usually very, very effective. But if, you, if you're left untreated or un, un, um, as soon as you get the first symptoms, then um, that, that's almost, I think that is 100%. Actually, I don't know if there's ever been a single case. Maybe there's one case that's ever, so rabies is one that, that I know. Ebola is interesting, where Ebola, if you can catch it, then you can give the patient supportive care. So as much as it, as a hemorrhagic fever, where the patients you sort of bleed out and they get leakage from the different organs because their blood vessels become, um, become affected, um, it, it looks dramatic, right? And, and you get these outbreaks, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in West Africa from a couple of years ago, so it looks more dramatic. But the, the, the health system is able to contain those, and people that are infected are able to be, um, are able to be saved. And then they're using the cells from those patients to try and work out how they can create a vaccine for that right now. So that's a, that's a key thing with, uh, with Ebola. But rabies, yeah, don't go playing with raccoons. <laughs> he, uh, he, only, he only wants to play with you for one reason, right? <laughs> I, I haven't heard that one, but it sounds great. Um, and, and Shaun of the Dead is in my top 10 films of all time. <laughs> Simon Pegg should be knighted yesterday. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, rabies is a good example of that, right? So, so you, 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 get two, you get two almost extreme cases of rabies. You get, you get sort of helplessness, kind of that sort of um, state where they, they, they kind of go into that sort of you know, catatonic state, that zombie-like state you're talking about. Um, or they can be in a really frenzied state, right, where they, they, they just go nuts and they're trying to... Now, so it's not that the, the, I mean, the virus isn't consciously doing that, it's just this is where evolution with the host is there, right? So the viruses that survive today after being around for millions of years are there because the ones that were able to make the host infect another host are the ones that survive, right? So it's almost like a, a pr proof of evolution thing for me, right? You've got two biological entities, uh, evolving together in order to, to create that situation. So that's, a, that's, a, that's the best example I can think of, but I, I am going to have to go home and look up zombie mice later and see what that... There you go. So that was probably a, it's a nematode or something like that. So that's a, that's a, a multicellular germ, if you like, right? So there's other kinds of parasites. And usually when people use the word parasite, they think of worms, tapeworms, and so on, right? So, so that's an example of that. Um, but, but in a way, though, that's the same sort of story as I just sort of said with rabies, right? It's the same different mechanism, different organism, different host. But the... the, the, the the way that it then transmits, that animal dies in a certain way that maximizes the chances of it passing on to another host, right? But ideally, an ideal pathogen doesn't kill the host, because if, if I then walk off onto a hill somewhere and die and decompose on the hill, I'm not going to infect another human, right? That's not, that's not the, that's, if you think about it, that's just not the point, right? Question there too. Yeah, any biology high school teachers here or uh, college teachers? It's, it's, I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, yeah, well. <laughs> We could say that about yellow jackets and everything, right? I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a piece to it for me that, um, think of the millions of years it took for even the first cell to actually form, right? And there was a series of experiments that, and I can't remember now, I used to know it, 
in the 50s where they tried to simulate um, the start of life, right? So they had chemical building blocks that would allow for nucleic acids, proteins to form and under an electric force, right? So they, they sort of, it was, I can't think with a, I can't think of the guy's name now. Um, and the simplest, like as you say, the simplest sort of um, sub-organism thing that you could have out of that would be a protein with a nucleic acid, which by definition is some viruses would fit that, would fit that sort of, fit that mode, right? And then as the hosts, if you think about it as the cells then evolved, um, it's not like those viruses didn't go away. Um, some cells would have died, some organisms would have died, maybe all that was left of them, maybe they were really simple intracellular organisms, and all that was left of them was their ability, they had a membrane, which some viruses have, right, or lipid, lipid layer, um, and a protein core, and a nucleic acid, but they had no mitochondria, or no endoplastic, endoplastic reticular system to, to enable protein synthesis, so they then would only grow if they were in another cell. So I think. It's, it's that early sort of primordial thing and going together and, and things dropping off and appearing. Um, and then in terms, of, um, in terms of, you know, are they always bad? Probably, I mean, it's easy to say yes, right? The ones that we care about are ones that are bad, but there's probably many, many others that are just, you know, around that, that, that have no pathological, they have no disease causing properties at all, right? But they're with us and amongst us and around us and they've, they either don't cause us any harm, they, they're happy enough to live whatever they live in, whatever organism they live in and cause no, no pathology. So, yeah, you'd have to get an evolutionary biologist to give you the full spiel on that one. I was going back right into my data banks there for that answer, I'm sorry. Hope, did it make a little bit of sense though? Yep. 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 It's like some of the cells in our body, right? So there are cells in our body that in some ways are more sophisticated than a fish, but the cell does the same thing, right? So there are cells in our body that don't have nuclei, and in other animals they do, right? So it's, it's, it's different, different situations, different cells in different contexts, different environments. And for viruses, that environment always has to include being inside another organism cell, right? Any others? Have you, have you heard about any of that research, um, I think coming from Russia, that as the permafrost melts, they think there may be ancient prehistoric viruses? Oh, there will be, yeah, they find, th there is a, th yeah, there is a sort of archeological microbiology, almost like a, a specialty where that, um, and I, I have a friend of mine who's a archeologist, her archeology span is specializing in, in um, the bone marrows and red cells of, of things that they find as well, right? So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty common to sort of find that, um, that sort of research. And, and that's one of the things that they would do as they, as they throw out these mummies and so on, that would be one branch of, of research they would do when they find. The planet warms up in the yep. Who knows, right? Yeah. yeah. Van, did you have a question too? Yeah, actually, uh, when you, you use the phrase live virus, then given the <laughs> that, what does that mean? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. So you can, so you can make them, um, oh, it's like an existential question you just asked me there. <laughs> you can kill a virus, right? So um, some of them you can kill by washing your hands with the cheapest soap you can buy, soap you can buy in the dollar store. Some of them you have to have, um, do that for a long time with that soap or, or, or do have, add chemicals to it and, and so on in order for it to work, right? And what I mean by that is you're just making it not infectious, right? You've basically, you've, you've denuded it. So for example, you get envelope viruses, viruses that have a lipid envelope around them are generally easier to kill because that's what soap does, right? When you, when you use soap, it, it breaks up lipid, right? So they're easier to kill. Whereas something that's difficult to sort of disinfect and kill, like a norovirus that causes winter vomiting disease, they can survive, survive, see I'm using an existential term again, they can remain viable um, in the environment for longer, right? Because they don't have that lipid, lipid layer. So then you have to use harder chemicals 
to disinfect those away. That's what I mean by that. So some vaccines actually are live virus and they're attenuated, some of them are dead virus. So they've killed the virus and you've got just dead viruses given. But you're right, the term is used in a very uh, non-biological way, but it's easier for, for people to understand, I guess. All right. Another, another one, another couple here. Yeah. No. Then no, I I don't well, actually giving it or. Yeah, I'm just curious I think I mean syringes. If you go to a medical museum, then you see a lot of syringes, right? Syringes are one of those, right? It's kind of a. And obvious, um, whether they would have scratched it onto them. So the other way that I, I, I think some, even some of the early Jenner experiments, right, where they would scratch and then rub the vaccinia, the cowpox virus preparation on to a scratch rather than have the, so they would have had, you know, it's, I mean, it, sounds, it sounds pretty gross, but you've got, you've got the pus from the cows that's got the vaccinia virus in. Um, you scratch the skin, you rub, the cow virus onto the, onto the, uh, onto the skin of the, the human and then they get the, a mild cow infection but the antibodies and the, the cells that they develop as an immune response is also effective against smallpox after. So I think mechanically that's how they did it, if I remember rightly. It's about, whether, how they, whether they did it in Valley Forge, I don't know, but I know the early stuff that Jenna did, it was, it was abrading the skin and then putting it on abraded skin. And there was another question there. Oh, hello. How are you? Hi. Somebody from work. She's yeah. got to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, viruses for cancer treatment? For cancer treatment? Yeah, so a um, lot of opportunity there, right? So um, with some trial and error over the last couple of decades. So actually um, in Philly, right, there's, a, there's actually a specialist center there. So the concept that you can add genes to the viral DNA that allow you to then create an immune response in the person you give that virus to, right? So you're almost vaccinating against the virus, if you know what I mean, right? So you basically take a, a, a virus that has um, a relatively inert disease, might cause a sort of low-grade fever for a few days. You modify the DNA, so you insert the genes in there that fix or, or create an immune response in the host to the cells that are, that are defective in the cancer patient, right? It's called immunobiology, it's part of immunobiology. So you, you can engineer um, using virus then as a vector. So you're actually using the virus as a vector to get new genes into a patient or into a host so that they can then get an immune response against that new, new protein that's gonna be expressed from that gene, right? So that's, that's, that's the concept of, of using viruses in, in, that, in that respect. And, um, you know, there's been, there was some earlier work in cystic fibrosis that, that didn't go well because um, the viruses they picked and the way they engineered them. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a huge area of sort of genetically modified viruses being able to create immune responses against, um, against diseases that, or against proteins that they, they previously didn't have. In theory, yeah. So any, any, so the whole area of um, genetic diseases, so rare genetic diseases, um, that's that's one of the potential mechanisms for um, creating, uh, well, mod in, in introducing a gene, a new gene to a host. Um, but usually, main the idea of it working in cancer or working in another infection. Um, where you want an immune response to beat it is, is better than in somebody with a, with a genetic abnormality that you're trying to modify, you know, because then you, you, you could actually make it worse, right? Uh, thank you, everyone.